Okay. Let's move on to the magnetic field. And the magnetic field, well, that's the curl of um, the vector potential. So if I try to do something along the lines of what I did in the previous lecture, I'll try to get the curl inside and see if I can manipulate this to get some more insight into how does the magnetic field change when you go to the case with retardation included. So if I just start off by examining this integral, putting the curl inside, then we get that v is equal to mu naught over 4 pi. The integral over d3 r prime, the curl of j of r prime t r over r. And this is with respect to the unprimed r vector, meaning that the partial derivatives act on this and this, the retarded time and the distance between the two points r and r prime. Now, this is easier to examine if we use the, um, if you look at one component at a time, because then we can simply use the levi civita tensor. So I look at the ith component of b, which turns this into a simple tensor product, epsilon i, j, k, d, j of uh, j, k of r prime t r over r. OK, so now I'm differentiating with respect, I'm differentiating the kth component of j with respect to the, the jth uh, component of the position vector. OK, so I need, in essence, d j j k over r. That's what I need to calculate. Um, and I uh, proceed as I did in the previous lecture when I did di of rho. And if I start writing this out, well, first of all, we get a contribution from the time in the numerator. So I get jk dot of r prime tr times minus 1 over c dj r, exactly as we had for the electric field, more or less, divided by r. That's the first term in uh, the product rule. Second term, that's the derivation with respect to the r in the denominator, denominator. And uh, that's a minus sign, in fact, jk of r tr dj r over r square. Okay, but I know now what dj of r is. Uh, it is simply, um, well, in fact, I can write it in the following way. I can factor out the dj of r minus jk of r prime tr. So that's this first term. I put the dot on. Um, over r times c. Um, yep. And then plus this, this other term, j, k, oh, oh. There's too much text on one page, I think. Uh, r prime, t r over r square times d j of r. And d j of r? That's simply r j over r. Like in the electric field case, of course, nothing changes with that factor. And now I can start to collect these terms back into the integral. Put these two into here and uh, see what we get. So bi is equal to 
minus mu naught over 4 pi, also minus from here, uh, integral of d3 r prime epsilon i j k r j over r. And the kth component of a vector, which is j k r prime t r over r square. It's a lot of math today. j k r t r over r c. OK, now this is simply a cross product. We recognize that. So this means that b vector must be r cross j. If I, uh, uh, yeah, if I just recognize this as a cross product, meaning that if I write this on vector form, that b in its final form is mu naught over 4 pi, and then the integral over two times, the spatial derivative term. at retarded time over r square plus the time derivative term j um, vector dot of r prime t r over c r cross r hat because this is now essentially r hat right okay so a lot of math, but uh, we get to the result. Yeah. The first term here is essentially the Biot-Savart law, which we recognize from magnetostatics. But now, because of the time retardation, we have an extra term here, which, um, as with the electric field, uh, you, you get an extra contrib contribution from the uh, because of the retardation effects. Yeah, and um, if we take away this term, then we're back to magnetostatics. Yep. And this is the Yefimenko's equation for the magnetic field. And as I said, these are not necessarily very convenient because now we have to integrate over vectors crossed with other vectors and so on. But it illustrates the point that uh, retardation introduces more than simply changing t to tr. Uh, we need to, um, to take properly, to take the retardation into account properly, starting from the Maxwell's equations to be sure that we get it right. So, any questions on this before we move on to, on to the fields and potentials from a moving point charge? Nothing? Okay. All right, so assume that we have a point charge which is moving around in space in an arbitrary fashion. What is the electric field and the magnetic field, or equivalently the potentials from that particle? That's the next question. And uh, as we've seen, we can't simply insert the position at um, some time or retarded time and expect to get the right result. So we have to calculate the potentials using the principles we already know, and then calculate the, the electric and magnetic field from those. That's that's the procedure. And these potentials have a name. They're called the Leonard Wickert potentials. And they're for a moving point charge.
So this could say be an electron moving around in the great cosmos, and there's a magnetic field which, uh, or electric field which affects it or whatever. We're going to find the potentials and fields from this particle that is moving around. Now let's see. The geometry is roughly like this. Uh, so I have some coordinate system, and I'm calculating the field at, the, at this observation point P. So the vector here is our vector, following our standard notation. The particle is moving on some unspecified trajectory, which is completely arbitrary in this context. And uh, let's see. So I call the position of the particle at time t rq of t. And the particle has charge Q. OK, so to recap our variables, the particle charge is Q. Position at time t is simply R Q of t. And the velocity. is vq of t, like this. And this is simply equal to the time derivative of the position, as, as always. Uh, yeah. standard, uh, standard mechanics, or kinematics. <laughs> yeah, and because the particle is now moving, and indeed, on a completely arbitrary path, we have to expect that the potentials and, and the fields are going to be dependent on time. But we can, we can write down the potentials because, uh, well, let's see, we can write down the, um, yeah, what I was trying to say was that the charge and current distributions depend on time. But we can write them down because this is a point particle. It shouldn't be hard. So rho of r. <coughs> T is equal to Q times delta of R minus R Q of T. So the delta function makes sure that the charge stays in exactly the position we set it in, the R Q. And similarly, the current density is Q times the velocity of the particle which is a function of time, times the same delta function. Like this. OK, so now we know the charge and the current distributions. And we should be able to find the potentials by, um, um, by integrating the standard, uh, by performing the standard integrals for the potential and the vector potential. So let's see. If I now insert into the expression for the scalar potential first, I get that I have an integral which is seemingly simple because it's full of delta functions. So let's see, it's d3 r prime dt prime rho of r t. And the Green's function, again, 1 over r delta of t minus t prime minus r over c. And the reason I go all the way back to the Green's function and uh, not on the form where I perform the t prime integral is that uh, the time will now depend on space as well, right? And we'll, we'll get back to that later. Uh, we could trivially perform, yeah, let's see. Yeah, the reason is that this r vector now effectively depends on time because we have simply a point charge racing around. So the distance here, which is big R, is now going to depend on time because this particle is racing around in space. Okay. And uh, for this reason, it's better to perform the spatial integration first 
because uh, the spatial integration just picks out this position. OK, so if I insert uh, my row into here, simply a delta function over position, this starts to take shape. I get that the potential is q over 4 pi epsilon naught all of time and space and a delta function of r prime minus r q of t prime and the delta function from the Green's function which gave us the retarded time effect and all of this di divided by r which is for now time independent on this form because it's simply r vector minus r vector prime. Uh, now I perform the r prime integral first as previously advertised. And this simply uh, turns um, r prime into r q. Okay? So that gives me q over 4 pi epsilon naught d t prime. The time delta has not yet been resolved, so it's delta of time, let's see, minus r q of t over c minus t prime. Whole thing divided by r q of t. And um, I now introduce the variable large r q, which is simply r minus r prime, but now r prime is just equal to r q because of the delta function. And uh, I can write it as r minus r q of t. And here you see the explicit time dependence on, uh, of, of r. Uh, yeah, so this is time dependent. Meaning that we have to take care when we do the time integral while r was just r minus r prime before we did the integral. And this is time independent. OK. And now to, to deal with uh, the integration over time, we have to, uh, let's see. We have this integral to deal with um, because, let's see, this function here inside could be zero at several points, which means that we have to pull out uh, um, uh, a general property of the delta function, which goes as follows. The delta of not just t or t minus something, but a general function of t is equal to sum over i, which denote the zeros of uh, g, and the delta of t minus t i, where t i is the time at which the function g is zero, <coughs> divided by a, a prefactor which comes from essentially a variable change here, that is g derivative of uh, t i absolute value. This is a general property of the delta function, and I'm sure you met it before in statistical mechanics, for example. So now, the definition of ti is simply that g <coughs> of ti is equal to zero, because that's when the delta function uh, says bang, right? And we have to assume that g derivative of ti is not zero, because if those two things happen at the same time, we can't use this formula because we have the derivative in the denominator. And if you divide by 0, you get, well, you certainly don't get anything sensible out. Uh, and in our case here, g is this um, function here inside the delta. OK.
Now, let's try to figure out this time integral. Let's see, in our case, g of t, let's identify that first. That's simply t minus rq of um, t prime divided by c minus t prime. Okay? And now the zeros of this function are defined by g of t naught prime is equal to zero, meaning that t naught prime is equal to t minus r q of t naught prime divided by c. So that's an implicit equation for um, that's an implicit equation for the zeros of the, um, of the function inside the delta function. Okay, and um, as you realize, this is nothing but the retarded time, of course. Tr is equal to, let's see, t minus rq of t r divided by c. Okay, so we will only get a contribution to the potential at the, when we evaluate the charge, the, let's say the point charge at the retarded time. Okay, so the field I'm seeing here now is the result of what happened to the particle at the retarded time. Same as always. Now we, we needed the, um, the derivatives of this g in order to perform the time integral. So we'll look into that. dt prime, g of t prime. That's the interesting part here. Let's see, that gives us something here using the chain rule. So I will get out. Um, this is equal to minus one over c, the prefactor, and then a fraction with two times r minus r q of t prime. And then the chain rule gives me the velocity of the particle, minus v q of t prime uh, divided by 2 r q of t prime minus 1. And this 1 simply comes from uh, from this t here, okay? Yeah. And if I simplify this a bit, it turns into minus one minus r q of t prime. That's this factor here, right? Divided by r q of t prime. So this is essentially um, uh, the direction, no wait, yeah, the direction of the position vector of the particle dotted with the velocity of the particle at t prime divided by c. So the units go away. Whew. So what was the question again? Uh, right. There should be a prime on this t here. Right, because we're integrating over t prime, meaning that it's the t prime dependence we're uh, interested in to see where we get the zeros in the delta function. <coughs> That's a good observation. Um, yep. 
Now, once we sorted all that out, we can get back to the expression for the potential, which was an integral over time. And then now left with this formula on the upper right and this expression for g and its derivative, we should be able to solve the integral. So back to the integral, v of r t is equal to q or 4 pi epsilon naught dt prime. And now we have a, a delta function, which gives us a retarded time. But we had to divide by the derivative of um, uh, of the function which was originally inside the delta function in order to get it on the simpler form, which means we have to divide by 1 minus rq of t prime divided by rq of t prime dot vq this all came from the derivative, right, over c, like this. And in addition, there was a factor 1 over r in the integral, rq of t prime. All right. Now, the delta function, as before, gives us a contribution only at the retarded time. And uh, this stuff came from the formula on the upper right, and this was in the integral all, all along. Yep. Wow, you really do love the, f uh, the, pre the sign. Um, I don't know. It might have been lost in action. Yeah, that's right. There's an absolute value here. So that's your answer. Nice observation. OK, it's good to hear that you're awa awake, even before lunch. Um, right. But now this is a simple integral, because there's just a delta function. So I can finally just stare at the integral and say, tell you what the answer is. And I will write it as follows. q over 4 pi epsilon naught and a 1 and an r q minus rq dot vq over c. Uh, ret. And by this, I mean that all of, the, uh, all of the variables inside the brackets are evaluated at the retarded time. So this means that I evaluate everything inside at the retarded time. OK, so this is one of the Leonard Wickert potentials, the scalar potential. OK, and now that we got the scalar potential, we um, can actually find A in uh, exactly the same way, um, uh, component-wise, so to speak. The, um, we recall that the current distribution was simply the velocity of the particle times the charge distribution. So it shouldn't come to as a surprise when I write down the vector potential that it's simply, let's see. mu naught q or 4 pi, a bracket vq, and then the same uh, denominator as here. That's rq minus rq dot vq 
by C. And all of these uh, variables evaluated at the retarded time. So A is uh, more or less the velocity of the particle times the scalar potential. So uh, they're um, uh, related like that. And I call this equation 2. And I call this equation 1. Okay, the expression for the scalar and the vector potentials. Uh, now these are the so-called Leonard Wickert potentials for a moving charge. Which we um, were trying to find from the beginning. Okay, so now we found, found those potentials. And um, perhaps more interesting, we'll also calculate the electric and the magnetic field from these. Okay, so just to recap what we found, we found the linear weaker potentials for the particle moving along some unspecified path with position RQ at retarded time, creating the field at point P at time T. This is RQ of the retarded time distance from the observation point where we measure the fields to the point where the particle was a while ago at the retarded time. While when we're measuring the fields, the particle has in fact moved off to where it is now, wherever that is. And we can't tell yet, right? Because the fields haven't reached us. And um, well, we found the scalar and the vector potentials for that. And usually we drop the Q subscript now because, because of all the delta functions, all the R's become equal to the R primes and so on. So we usually skip the, the Q's and um, just to uh, write it down on the standard form, we, which you find in the book, the potential can be written as this Q over 4 pi epsilon naught 1 over R minus, oh wait, wait, 1 minus beta dot r hat and all the r's and betas at the retarded time. The only distance which is interesting now is of course this distance uh, and the vector potential Well, it's related to the scalar potential simply by a constant and the velocity, 1 over c squared. The velocity, again, this is the velocity of the particle, since that's the only velocity in the problem, times the scalar potential. And the beta is simply defined as the velocity divided by c, so um, the length of beta will give you the, the fraction of the speed of light that the particle is moving with. And um, you should notice that if you go to the non-relativistic limit, that simply means beta is much less, is much less than 1. So that's uh, that's one reason to use beta. It's simply easy to compare to the number one. 
And then we get back to the, well, if you look at this term, uh, if beta is very small, then you can simply uh, consider using the, um, the standard Coulomb's expression for the potential. And A will disappear if beta is zero, of course, because then there's no current. OK, and uh, so we have three weeks left of lectures. We'll begin on Monday by finding the electric and the magnetic field from this uh, moving point charge. We'll move on to chapter 11, which deals with radiation from an arbitrary source. Um, this is the theory for that, of course. And um, once we've done that, if we have time, I was thinking either we repeat some of them, which is one or one and a half weeks, I expect. So we have two or three lectures. I would like to try to find some applications of electromagnetism to show you. Or you could ask me if you wanted, some, wanted something uh, to be repeated on the lectures. Um, so uh, I'm open to suggestions. I, I can't promise that we'll have plenty of time for uh, exam problems or whatever you want. But uh, at least you have to su suggest something if we have time. So I have time to prepare something. OK? So see you Monday. <laughs>